Good evening, everyone. Namaste. Welcome to the first online study circle organized by the Adivakta Parishad, Delhi High Court Unit. Usually, we would meet everyone on a Friday at the Delhi High Court premises. Our sessions, which have been happening for the last 10 years or so, have taken place at the bar room opposite court number 35. Now, because in these unprecedented times and unexpected times where we don't know where we are headed, However, we should not grow apart of each other. The legal fraternity should stick together and come close than ever before. That is why we thought we'll take this initiative of organizing our first online study circle with a very well-known legal luminary of our fraternity, Sri Aman Lekhi, who is with us today. We've had this uh, privilege and honor of hosting him on our platform. Uh, throughout these 10 years, we've had various legal luminaries who've come and graced us, addressed us on various legislations, policies, rules, procedures. And in this technology age, in this information age, we would just want to take it further ahead. So we welcome lawyers, we welcome professionals, we welcome students, teachers from across India because the power of internet is such, there is no boundaries of space or time or uh, location. So we are joined here from people across India, across all corners of India. And uh, before I have Sir on, just a brief introduction about Sir I would like to give. We are today discussing two topics, which is uh, about, one is about virtual hearings. There is a lot of talk going around as to whether virtual hearings is the way to go about things. And sir has had an experience of attending webinars and video conferencing in the Supreme Court. So we would like to hear sir on that. And second issue that we, we would be discussing is the force measure clauses. And there is a lot of talk. A lot of companies have had this doubts, clarifications, and a lot of advisories have gone out from a lot of law offices about force measure clauses. So we'll come to that later. Uh, as we all know, sir became a senior advocate in the year uh, 2005, he was designated. Very recently, he's been involved with extremely important uh, constitutional matters. As recent as in March 2020, he was part of the uh, Madras High Court judgment about the functions of the Honorable Governor of the Union Territory of uh, Puducherry. And that appeal was uh, allowed by the Madras High Court and sir had appeared for the Union of India in that appeal. Apart from that, he has appeared in cases involving the appointment of the Naval Chief, which, in which he got a favorable order on uh, for the government. And uh, some other cases also very recently, he was involved in the Calcutta High Court order about e-cigarettes, where the ordinance that was passed by the government of India was upheld. And uh, he has also appeared in the VVIP chopper scam, where an anticipatory bail plea was filed and sir appeared on behalf of the enforcement directorate. And also uh, a case challenging the operability of the NIA Act, sir was also appeared there. So sir has been appearing very regularly, regularly for the Union of India as in capacity of, the of being an additional solicitor general. So we would like to hear, sir, we would not like to keep all of you waiting. Uh, so, Sri Aman Lekhi, sir, I welcome you to uh, Adivakta Parishad. On behalf of the Adivakta Parishad Delhi High Court Unit, I welcome you. Uh, so, la let's begin, sir, uh, on about the first topic, which is about virtual hearings. If sir could address us. Yeah, yeah Shimendu, thank you so much and thank you for inviting me. I think it's a very laudable initiative, as you very correctly said, and uh, something which uh, will, in many ways, augment. Uh, uh, our knowledge about things which are very topical and relevant. Uh, without wasting any time, uh, I just want to bring, I don't want to preface what I'm saying by just uh, uh, telling. Uh, without acting as a, as a killjoy, uh, the enthusiasm which is there where uh, virtual hearing is concerned, I, I am not going over the top where this particular facility is concerned. And uh, the reason for my not going on the top, and for that matter, thinking some kind of magic bullet uh, is uh, because a realistic assessment uh, cannot but acknowledge the existing state of our legal infrastructure. 
and uh, any kind of technology has to fit the infrastructure and the infrastructure which exists has to be adapted to use it effectively and uh, while much has been said uh, in most cases laudatory and not without justification that yes this is technology which uh, can improve the justice delivery system uh, there are uh, various pressing issues which i feel have not been addressed or acknowledged uh, while uh, promoting this method uh, as uh, a means of uh, legal problem solving and why i say so is uh, i talked about the legal terrain uh, the sheer logistics of it uh, is something which is uh, very daunting and why do i say it's daunting because we are talking about uh, virtual hearing the trial court this is actually the topic here and if you see as far as the legal system is concerned uh, how is it it's going to work i mean one part of it is yes it saves time it will uh, uh, facilitate uh, a seamless communication it will save costs yes this is something which is repeated continuously and uh, ad nauseum we are hearing various people talk about it but there is a flip side to it which cannot possibly be ignored and see where it functions because we have ideas in our mind of systems very different uh, like canada or south south uh, south africa australia the system which i'll come to later system which are very different from the indian system and uh, where we cannot replicate the kind of method that they have even singapore i'll deal with singapore later uh, why i say so is and please don't get me wrong the purpose is not uh, for me to say to dump this technology altogether but point is for us to be aware as to how is that we have to use the technology and so that it is uh, relevant for us and if you look at it uh, if you see how many cases are there in the trial court there are about three about three crore cases right now pending in the trial court there are more than 15000 courts more than 3000 court complexes which are there now as far as technology is concerned this technology has to apply to these this situation and it's applied to this situation uh, when very importantly we have only a fraction of the gdp uh, which is used for the purposes of judiciary in fact the national average is 0.08% is the national average that is concerned and when you talk about technology and that to virtual hearing which entails of course investment in fiber optics and high speed cables etc apart from the other aspects whatsoever the expense which is to be involved apart from the fact that its effectiveness where this system as such is concerned will come later how is it that from where will we get the resources and whether we have a plan in mind for the purposes of our using these resources and we have only a fraction of this uh, of the finances available actually dedicated dedicated to judiciary this brings me to the first point there has to be a change in thinking you just can't look at this and say okay wow we got something new and because we got something new there's a lot of excitement about it but we can't go over the top where this is concerned because we have to be realistic what this is the first thing is have you thought about how is it that we are going to effect this by keeping apart a substantial chunk for the purposes of financing this activity this is number one number 2 this so far as this aspect is concerned it's not just money alone if you look at our system as such uh, whether it is a death population issue or something which is very much talked about i don't need to delve into that uh, uh, much because we got one of the least in the world apart from the fact that there is the death population ratio itself is poor we have an ancillary issue of the number of judicial officers again the trial court being less that is the existing strength is less than the sanction strength and not just the judicial officers are less in any case the facilities which are there too for the judicial officers are also in many ways inadequate the supreme court is seeing this particular matter in any case and they are augmenting of these particular facilities this becomes the second point which has to come in that when we are dealing with this the people have to work it that is the availability of both the physical and the human resource for the purposes of working the system has also to be kept in mind so this is the second thing which we have to do for the purposes of up, up, overhauling the system and upgrading it for the purposes of having these available for this particular purpose number 3 as as uh, this issue is concerned equally relevant here is we had a very ambitious program that is the the e court program and if you look at the order of supreme court of 6 april it refers to e court program 2 and it talks for the e court program in rather complementary term that is should uh, it is a very ambitious program a program which actually opens the vistas for the purposes of changing the landscape whatsoever of our of our legal system But the point is that this program, which actually started and it has over over a three-year phase, 2007 to 2011, the first phase was 2011 to 2015, and second phase is 2015 to 2020. Apart from the fact, and it has made it has made substantial progress. Yes, there has been certain changes that brought about. But as far as the changes are concerned, what is 
what what the primary change which has come over here is that we have a system of video conferencing video conferencing which is exciting all of us a lot these days but the video conferencing which you have is actually limited to a very niche kind of hearing and rightly so which i'll come to later that you can't possibly have video conferencing for all kind of hearing so you got video conferencing for say remand or for the purposes of uh, examination of 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 witnesses recording of evidence etc is concerned uh, that is primary use of this particular exercise of uh, the e courts which has come apart from the fact that we got uh, uh, the the cause lists which are there on the net and of course the orders and a large number of orders the orders are running into crores or in numbers the number of orders which are there which are available online for the purposes of access to justice for facilitating say the policy making in this is concerned but this is not something which is equipped adequately to deal with the question of say video conferencing of our moving forward to have effective court hearings virtually to have virtual court which you are actually actually concerned with because you can't have virtual court simply by plugging a computer having people and then speaking to it and feeling very happy that she be spoken something we saw ourselves on the screen we have people without on the other side with, with whom there is a fair amount of distance you don't need to actually travel there and we can conclude it in a short period of time but the very thing which make it attractive also have the limitation which is actually absolutely absolutely implicit in it because it's not as a video conferencing concern video conferencing would require one along with this particular thing digitization of records now digitization of records is something that, which is which cannot cannot possibly be ignored and that digitization has to be from filing to disposal to archiving in any case so this brings us to another issue where are we with digitization of records is concerned that is if you want to have virtual headings you need to have paperless proceedings and for paperless proceedings even the supreme court we got e filing over here you have to file hard copies in any case if you file hard copies in any case that means you have in the back of your mind the fact that yes where we are concerned this particular e filing system may not by itself address the issue which which we may confront and there is a need therefore for the purposes of there being some kind of a physical backup for the purposes of having having this particular thing now keeping all these things in mind what we have to see is that this is a question not simply as i said of having a computer screen and talking to the way we are talking now because this is a this is not like this demena is a very simplistic way uh, uh, of actually interacting because here you have me talking and everyone listening in any case but just multiply this into 3 crores and bring in cases and then bring in case materials and bring in the lawyers and bring in multiple lawyers and then bring in the judges too and along with the judges bring in the witnesses also now in this system this method through which we are communicating by which we are actually talking how is it that we are going to work it over this period of time for the purpose of accommodating all the stakeholders in in the system to have some kind of meaningful and effective participation in it because for 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 uh, adjudication participation is very important and not just actual participation a feeling of participation is also to be uh, very important and the both actual participation and feeling of participation is actually very very material for the purpose of efficacy of of this particular system so what is necessary is that we have to not talk only of this you have to talk about say the web the designing the designing of the system and the designing of the system will also require reengineering of the way in which it has to work and for reengineering of the way in which it has to work we have to bring in the it we have to bring in the hr uh, human resource people also so it has to be a combined effort a combined effort to suit what is actually our existing legal system for the purpose of having this particular facility as being actually useful for the purpose of justice delivery now i have talked about uh, this uh, the e court program and that's why i have talked about the e court program because the timeline is very important now if you look at the timeline of the e court program over the period as i pointed out from 2011 to 2020 all you have here is we got we got the case uh, cause list we got the judgments and you got limited use of video conferencing now what has happened this this particular time in let's just say what has happened elsewhere where there is concern but uh, i give the example of citizens of singapore and so as singapore because uh, that is very important because we have to place things in perspective singapore is not not the ideal uh, uh, comparison for india in fact is for comparison india is concerned i don't think there is any legal system because we got a very robust legal system uh, which does not have a parallel and the system which which actually as a judicial system is concerned a very well functioning legal system which is not concerning all its inadequacies not concerning all the problems uh, a robust legal system which is doing very well but now that's because we talk about virtual hearing is concerned the reason i'm saying to 
in Singapore, there was a, a system called EFS, electronic filing system. Now, electronic filing system was then replaced by what was called an integrated uh, electronic litigation system. Now, integrated lit uh, electronic litigation system was an improvement of the electronic filing system. Electronic filing system was in any way system much better, far superior to the system which we have in the e-court system. The e-court system in which we don't have possibly case management, we don't have judicial management, and we've got absolutely no facility for, for virtual hearings. Now, this system was already in place. And the system which was in place was improved. And it was improved from being fact specific to case specific. And it was an integrative program involving the law firms, the lawyers, and the judges, so that the front end and the back end actually corresponded. And the system worked on the hearing for accessibility to the documents, for access also to the legal material, and eventually fixing the dates of hearing and actually having the hearing. And the system was in place. And the system was an improvement over the electronic filing system which was there earlier. And we, despite having a dedicated program, even as a pilot project, for say a limited number of cases, for a particular number of courts, for a specific type of matters, were not able to devise. And we did not devise something which could be more or less parallel, despite the fact that there was a system also in place over there. Now, Singapore is not the only only. Uh, uh, oh, just yeah. if I may just comment, there are some some comments that are uh, coming in. Yeah, yeah. So if I may just uh, put it out on screen. Yeah. The first one is uh, from Mr. Kohli. This is on the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. uh, he asks uh, that virtual hearing concept is very good and is in need of the hour. But how, with utmost sincerity, can we deal with witnesses? So before you answer this, may I just also request you to, if you can just uh, take the camera, if you could just shift your camera because, uh, yes, if you can. further, sir, further, I think uh, this is, this is, this is better, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. So this is the first question that we'll just take up, then we can yeah. continue. Yeah, this is a very good question, Pradeek. Uh, uh, I, I, I was to come to it eventually, but you, uh, I'll deal with it immediately. That's precisely the point I'm making. As the witnesses are concerned, there are various issues which come over here. Witnesses are concerned, as the logistics of it, in any case, considering the number of cases which we have over here. And apart from witnesses, insofar as uh, when you talk about cross examination, the various aspects which come along with the cross examination, apart from confronting a witness in any case, which will require, as I said, digitization of records, or at least existing of a file which is more or less the same on both sides of the screen, with everyone on the same page that is concerned. One. Two. And taken criminal matters, we have uh, the issue as in so far as the sealing of a sealing of a document is concerned, or sealing of a, an object is concerned. Now, what is very important in these cases is the seal intact. Or uh, is the seal there at all or not? Or look at the seal. Is the seal the same at all or not? So for that itself, we need to have a camera. Apart from the camera, and there has to be someone to actually look at the seal. And not only look at the seal, then to examine it for that particular purpose. And then conclude whether of course is the seal is the same, or the seal is intact at all or not. Or give another example. In so far as the witness is concerned, and in the course, some an issue crops up. The case diary has to be seen. The case diary is the police file. The court has got access to the case diary. But where is the police file? Is the police file where the court is concerned? Is the court or the police file the same place? And even if they are the same place, you can anticipate whatever it is. And how is it that the logistics of it is to be in any case dealt with? And then multiply this. Multiply this into three crores. Or multiply it say two crores or one crore. Now, how is it that you are going to have this particular system in this particular case? And more importantly, the biggest studies. The studies over here, which actually say, Harvard has done some studies also, actually say that the way in which the camera is placed also has a very important role to play as to how the mind is to be affected. Because the, the placement of the camera itself can in some way exude some kind of image. And when you're talking about criminal trials, the trials are such on this criminal trials, image is very important. Because no matter how objective the judge may be, and no matter how dispassionate they may seem to be, and so what the method of dealing is concerned is some way subjectively influenced by our prejudices. So various issues have also cropped up with that is concerned as to how do you place the camera, how do you dress up with that is concerned, in what way do you show a witness actually involved, the or the sound quality, how audible it is, and so that is concerned. Is it is it clear? Uh, is the technology which is being used at both places the place where uh, the Court is the judge is sitting, the place where the uh, lawyer is sitting, the place where the witness is concerned. Are the facilities the same in any case? How do you regulate that particular mechanism? Now, all those things require a very detailed uh, infrastructure which has to be there, which we must actually work on to make it effective. Yes, sir. So, the second question that we'll just take up uh, privacy of parties also becomes very important. Yeah, not a uh, privacy of parties, not only for encryption. I was going to come to that. I'm very, uh, this, uh, we got a very intelligent audience. 
Now, privacy, this, uh, Ranjita is absolutely correct. This concern, there are two aspects of it. One is privacy, and the other is security, because the, the, the question actually combines the two. Security is something which you have to you have to have firewalls, you have to have systems in any case to ensure that insofar as the uh, the the link is concerned, that link remains secure. The link is not breached in any case, and there is no unauthorized intrusion into it or distortion of it. That is the security aspect of it, and so that is concerned. That has been the actually designed and designed also with a fair amount of circumspection intelligence. The other is the privacy. This is again something which has actually uh, uh, engaged the attention of many people here. It's engaged the attention of people because. Uh, in say criminal hearings, the person is accused. Now, if, uh, now as far as these hearings are concerned, uh, uh, as long as the hearings actually are confined to the parties who are there, because everyone is knowing the identities of each other, uh, this can have bearing also on the privacy issue of a particular person, particularly if you if you deal with the fact that if you extend virtual hearing to say live streaming for the purposes of uh, for uh, uh, addressing what is called the theory of access to justice and open hearings. I've got uh, very strong reservation that is concerned also. I mean, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't endorse uh, live streaming as uh, as some kind of panacea uh, to deal with all legal problems as to be some kind of check over what's going to happen because live streaming also has got its limitations because uh, I personally feel where, as I always say, uh, judicial proceeding, judicial review is counter majoritarian and uh, because it is not something we don't have judges who are elected one for good reason you got that and we have to insulate judges also from this kind of popular pressure or just which uh, in grandiloquent terms may be called tyranny of the majority or tyranny of the most vocal i will not call it tyranny of the majority so all these things have to be kept in mind you have to decide upon who when what what kind of matter you can't have it across the board all kinds of matters cannot be done uh yes sir. so uh this now, is a question yes so Yes, absolutely. Yes, the yes, demeanor, yes. Now, for demeanor, there, there are various guidelines in place. What can normally happen is that there should be a person on both ends of the proceedings and a note should be made of the demeanor. A note should be made to the demeanor. There can be a point person where the, the witness's statement is recorded and there can be someone on the other side uh, where the judge is concerned. And a demeanor is concerned, the record can be contemporaneously made uh, by whoever is participating in the proceedings. It's a very important question, Mr. Rao. This is a question which, again, is very material in these matters. For, but for that, they need to have a contemporaneous record the demeanor, which can actually be made part of uh, uh, the proceeding as such. Right, sir. Is, is any, should I then uh, move forward? Because I was on the other systems. Yes, uh, sir, yes. Sir. Now, I, we talked about, I mean, that's why these questions are very pertinent because they actually open the issue up altogether. And it's something which we have to, we have to, we have to in many ways look at. Now, Similarly, you see, we have in the Federal Court of Australia Act, the Federal Court of Australia Act 2 has got provisions for virtual hearing. The very important thing is you have to learn something from it. Virtual hearing, where that is concerned, is on an application, can be done so much by the court too. And you have to justify the need of, uh, of those hearings. And it is only when the, those particular virtual hearings are actually suited for the activity, which, uh, for the kind of uh, proceeding which have to take place. And they have looked at that, they tested the equipment on both sides, the quality of that is concerned, the suitability, the, to what extent the documents, etc., are there. Now, it is only then that the virtual hearing, so it's not as if it's across the board. Virtual hearing is in all kinds of uh, matters, in every kind of case, whether there's need at all or not. It's not as if no, it's not as if it happens over there also. Similarly, you have you have virtual hearings, uh, you had virtual hearings in South Korea, which I happen to read about. And of course, everyone knows the Criminal Justice Act, and so far as the Access Justice Act, the UK is concerned. Where again, as far as the virtual hearings are concerned, the virtual hearings are also not, uh, 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 they exclude criminal matters, for essentially for case management uh, or ancillary hearing or remote examination of witnesses, etc. is concerned. So when you talk about these virtual hearings, virtual hearings across systems, the systems, as I said, are very different from the system which actually we have over here, which has problems which are unique to it. And because the problems which are unique to it, the efficacy of this particular hearing has necessarily to adapt and adjust to those particular problems. And we have to then mold the system to meet it. And the moral system to meet it, also you have to decide, one, what is the kind of hearings which you have to do? Two, what in so far as kind of hearing the concern, you have to the procedure, the discipline has to be, because you have to have a limit, a number of lawyers are going to speak, because it's not it's not unusual to have multiple lawyers. You can have one case, but you can have one party and have 10 lawyers. And each lawyer will speak, because everyone has to be heard, because until you are heard, you're not going to get paid. So the, the kind of chaos can be managed in the courtroom, because you've got physical space and size, it is not an issue, and you've got indulgent courts. So we'll have to see, I mean, lawyers. Number three, 
we have to prepare in advance and so well prepare in advance in two ways there can be pre court hearing as to how is it the proceeding have to take place so for deciding how the hearing have to take place you have to prepare in advance now what happens here is you got the oral argument stream over here uh, most lawyers who will argue over here will uh, uh, will develop the arguments while they are arguing it's not as if they will prepare the arguments prior confine themselves to the points of made and then speak it so a point strikes us and we just say it's a good point and because we are not bound by discipline we will speak the court now that kind of facility will not be there because the documents will have to be digitized availability has to be there it should be known in advance what going to cite in each other so you have to have some kind of agreement as to what is it that you are going to argue that is, there should be some exchange of its for written arguments are concerned what going to argue then you have to be also the agreement as to what documents there has to be some something like a convenience compilation which is over there that yes you are going to have like these documents only or these relevant these issues only which have to be there in any case so this is their final arguments are concerned it may be used in final arguments and limited number of final arguments where these particular issues can be dealt with its suitability for trial has got its own limitation requires something which actually be thought about with a fair amount of sincerity and so far as bail is concerned it's being you can hear this kind of matters today these days you are hearing bail and other kind of urgent matters because you are hearing one matter at a time and uh, it's only at the discretion of the court as to which matter is to be heard and the kind of multitudes of cases which is over there and for so the volumes of matters are there which is current in the legal system is not there so you got a system which can manage it but just just uh, uh, imagine a scenario where the system is the way it is then we go to court so the number of matters which are there which we actually which we actually handle and then see have a reality check take a step back take a deep breath think and then apply that yes you got this technology this technology has got its merits but this technology which has its merits and is available to what extent can this technology be used where it can be used how much money we have to use it and in so far as the courts are concerned are we in a position to connect the courts with it because it's not just the camera or uh, anything else whatsoever there are various issues along with it apart from the fact that you got equipment over here you need electricity you need to have internet you need to have quality you like to have education in some cases where this particular issue is concerned all these things have to be taken into account by this concern and just can't say that yes now we got this this is so far as the solution is concerned the solution is there uh, for dealing with it the quorum non judis is quorum non judis is not something it's uh, this is as 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 something a matter of levity yes in so far as quorum because if it is part of if rules prescribe for a virtual hearing and the metho methodology is actually decided as far as virtual hearing the concern has been done in an exercise that passed the supreme court as extend the 142 that is absolutely so the jurisdiction is concerned the jurisdiction is there the hearings are uh, procedurally mandated there is substantive law behind it the methodology and the application of law is known the parties are following a protocol which is which is well settled and uh, uh, the capacity of the courts to deal with it should not be doubted if i'm not on the issue of quorum non judice at all there's no requirement of quorum non judice over here where this is concerned of course there will be amendments or rules which have been done on a permanent basis for the purposes of legitimizing whatever procedure is there so that uh, should there be any challenge to this particular method which i think would be far fetched to remote and completely unwarranted uh, my problem is not with this question of quorum juris my problem is something far more substantial serious and far reaching as the efficacy of this particular system the existing scenario in which we are which we are uh, which we are working right sir uh, we could is also there... move to force measure yeah we could also move to force measure and then yeah. maybe people have questions we can come back to that subject later as well yeah now force wager that this will be a, this is a completely now force wager again something which is uh, uh, much has been written about force wager and uh, uh, as a term which is something which it's uh, I, i must commend you for uh, choosing this as a topic because something that has to have clarity now what is force wager now force wager what is important is that uh, i will not go into definition because there's something which is which is impasse uh force major should not be considered as a french version of vis major that is standard now vis major is an act of god force major is something which is far greater that is something more than act of god in in, in any in any case is something more the point is that as far as this question is concerned it is basically uh a term or a clause by which uh, uh a party of both parties can uh, be excused from either fully or completely performing the contract or to suspend uh, the performance of the contract or extend the time within which it is to be done it is basically es essentially it, uh, it is a clause in a contract which actually uh, uh, is force wager 
and in first four stages concerned it refers to circumstances which are independent of the will of the person concerned that is very important like not something we have a four stage clause that is a clause which can in some way suspend or extend the performance prevent or to excuse any prevention or deterrence i'll give you these aspects later but the condition precedent is it should be something beyond the control of the parties uh, where uh, where this issue is concerned and uh, uh, the event should be one which is very important uh, should be one which should have been in the contemplation of the parties at the time this actually happened now this is very material because uh, force pages is usually used interchangeably with frustration and even supreme court judgments have not gone to supreme court judgment by reputed judges and ever and counsel in any case i often use the ex expression interchangeably but force page and frustration are two distinct and mutually distinct things and the distinction must necessarily be kept in mind when we when we deal with this issue of force page so it's basically a clause a clause which can in some way excuse the suspend excuse the suspend because the circumstances are beyond the control and circumstances beyond the control should be nevertheless those which should be in the contemplation of the parties and when you are dealing with the force page clause this comes the next thing or how do you interpret a force page clause now when you look at a force page clause you don't look only at the force page clause you look at a clause you look at the wording of the clause you look at what is what precedes it you look at what follows it you look at the scheme of the agreement itself look at the purpose of the agreement itself and then you place a force page clause in it don't look at the term of the force page clause only see it in the context the setting for the purpose of actually finding what the meaning because the meaning which has been used the word is over there can be in some way uh, influenced or colored by what actually is surrounds it and that is actually the basic principle of interpretation of contract which you have to actually see now when you deal with this what is necessary is what is what is that you have to consider by dealing with force page clause one how do you define it that you must define it with precision that is this is this because we don't have to you have to define it precision not only because it only then you have an efficacious force page clause but unless there is definition with precision there will be the contract itself will be void for uncertainty Number two, it, the, you have to actually set out the effect. What is going to be the effect of it? And this is where force major will be different from, um, say, frustration, because as the force major is concerned, it can say, okay, I'll give you more time, or we suspend the performance for a particular point of time, and we can watch for a particular period of time. And termination will not necessarily follow. Termination will come eventually, but it will not necessarily happen of its own. And that is where comes the third aspect of force major, apart from the definition and the effect. that the process what is the method by which it's been worked and this method is very important because as you all would be knowing as to the terms are concerned the term can be a condition precedent or can be intermediate term now if it's a condition precedent uh, and it is worded as a condition precedent for anyone to actually invoke the force page clause uh, you have to actually strictly follow the method which actually means prescribed because unless you follow the method which is prescribed your capacity to actually uh, invoke the force page clause would to that extent be affected But if it's an intermediate term, it's an intermediate term in which, in fact, it, you cannot possibly make the invocation of force be the conditional upon that particular exercise. In that event, uh, mainly because you not strictly follow the way in which has come, will not necessarily affect uh, this particular uh, 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 method of invocation of the force major clause. Now, while dealing with force major, I only began by saying that this, so far this is concerned is a different from frustration. I'll deal with that later. It's also important to know that the force major. is not an exemption clause this is another thing which has to be kept in mind because there is some kind of similarity between a force major and an exemption clause but there is no identity uh, uh, between uh, the force major and and and, and uh, an exemption clause because what a force major does is, is important uh, to be put it very simply the force major clause qualifies what is actually an absolute obligation uh, instead of providing what will happen in the event of a breach that is very material because you say i promise to do this thing if this happens so you qualify what has done so it's not an absolute obligation the obligation or i'll be exempted from doing this in these circumstances so it's not an absolute obligation it's a qualified obligation because a qualified obligation is in terms of it is in the way the way in which the contract clause is worded because the contract clause is worded therefore force major goes to the clause in the contract itself and because the clause in the contract itself is different from frustration because that deals with some supervening circumstances beyond the contemplation of the parties which is over there so it's not an exemption clause it's got some similarity to exemption clause it's not frustration it may have the consequences of the frustration but it is absolutely distinct in so far as these aspects is concerned so you have to see it is different from frustration it is different from an exemption clause it is actually a clause of the contract circumstances because of some supervening because something which is not in the contemplation beyond the will of the parties concerned 
Now, in so far as force field is concerned, what is what what all do you have to keep in mind? One, there's something called what is called triggering event. As I said, so that will be in so far as the clause is concerned, you have to set out what the triggering event should be in so far as you have to specify it out. And that is where the difference between the bis major and a force major comes in because in so far as bis major is concerned, the bis major is basically in an act of war, force pages goes beyond, goes to inundations, it goes to wars, it goes to spikes, it's called kind of administrative, litigative, uh, limitation, etc. So it, it was far wider in its ambit. Now, yes, yeah, now uh, this is a good question. COVID, please understand, COVID, but it's not act on its own. Now, if the COVID could have, it could be both act of God, but because COVID has been supplemented by various kinds of administrative dictates. They got some kind of laws which have not been invoked. We got a disaster, national, national disaster management act. We got the dictates that being issued under the act by the state government, by the national government, by district authorities only. Because we got these dictates that being issued, which have in some way in, influenced and influenced freedom of action of people. And they're stopped. Like there's a quarantine, there's self isolation, there's stopping of manufacture, there's stoppant of movement. So transportation, storage, manufacture, everything is affected in many in, in many cases at all. And that is affected not only because of COVID. COVID is there, yes, but whether COVID was the reason at all or not, this is a legal sanction, legally sanctioned way in which certain actions have been prohibited or if not stalled altogether. Because this has happened, it can be a first major event, quite the clause actually stipulates for it. And even if it's a first major event in any case, when it's a first major event, you have to see what does the contract deal with it. Does it entitle you to avoid it altogether? Or does it in any way deal with it in so, so as to delay it, to suspend it? Because uh, because this is this is very important where this aspect is concerned. Thank you, Manisha. Where this is concerned, this is very important where this is concerned. So how you are wording the clause. Everything turns on the wording of the particular clause. So I was on the triggering events, which is there. Right? So you have to see the triggering events, sir, which is which is there, uh, uh, which you have to identify. Then you have to see as the, what's the triggering effects are concerned. There should be causal link. It's not that there be a triggering event. There should be a causal link between the triggering event and the event. So without a causal link, you cannot possibly have a, a, a first major clause. And I'll deal with it now that I'm dealing with the causal link. Like there's a case. I'll give you a simple illustration. Now, suppose there's a contract, right? And the contract talks about shipping, shipping of something, uh, shipping of whatever is the contracted supply. And it's shipping of supply, let's take fish. And uh, the shipping of supply, and the contract says, unless there's a failure to fish, uh, failure of uh, crop, a failure of whatever uh, uh, the, the product is concerned, there's no question of uh, the first, the first pager will come on, say, a failure of a crop, which has happened over here. Now, supposing there is no failure of crop as such, but there's an increase in price because certain wartime uh, inhibitions have been placed the way in which land is to be used. Because it limits the area in which land is available and also makes access to the land and working on the land tough. Now, access to working on land tough shoots the prices up. Now, it shoots the prices up. There's no failure of the crop. There's no failure of the crop. But in so far as the question is concerned, because the circumstances surrounding makes this particular question of growing the crop more expensive. Now, I said that growing the crop is expensive. Now, this is something way beyond my means. Now, because it's way beyond my means, as said is concerned, therefore, I will not do it. But is there a causal link between what is stated in the contract and what actually followed? There's no causal link because the failure was to be the link. And here it's not a question of failure, the circumstances which is actually independent of the failure. So number two, there has to be some causal link between the two. Number three, what is also important is that uh, as far as clauses are concerned, uh, there is a difference between say preventing, hindering or delaying. Now the requirements of preventing and hindering, delaying are all very different. It's not as if in every case the legal consequences of which are absolutely, absolutely the same. Now when you talk about prevent, uh, preventing the uh, performance of the contract. And the preventing the performance of the contract would be something which makes it a physical impossibility or it makes it a legal impossibility. The threshold is very high. That is something which it cannot happen at all. And so that is concerned. That is preventing uh, uh, preventing uh, what what has uh, what, what is actually stipulated. Now, preventing is different, different from, say, hindering. The threshold of hindering will be, will be less. Even if, supposing I am not prevented altogether, but the working of the contract may be such that it may dislocate my system altogether. Or there may be some string contracts may be elsewhere, which can be in some way affected in totality with, with the way in which they have to work with each other. And I cannot possibly do perform one contract at the detriment of all the other contracts and bring my this system to a standstill altogether. So while theoretically I may be in a position to perform this particular contract, but because this, the performance of this particular contract will put me in some kind of jeopardy where other contracts are concerned. 
and lead me into some kind of breaches where those aspects are concerned in any case so that will be in some case hindering of the contract itself or it can be delayed you can say okay as such is concerned i am in this this problem because i am in this problem over this period of time because i am in problem in this period of time this will give me extension of time the extension of time again will come as far as the procedure is concerned you have to word it in that particular uh, uh, clause for the purpose of dealing with that particular contingency for the purpose of deciding whether a call it will be preventing or hindering at all of that particular contract itself and these circumstances that we say should be beyond the control it's not something that you just said apart from the causal link there has to be some circumstances should be actually beyond the control of the parties uh, parties concerned and most importantly that as not only beyond the control that there has to be an attempt at our end at the end of any parties invoking the fourth major clause that any reasonable steps to mitigate uh, the non performance it's not as if by because they are in the realm of contract and the realm of contract the bargain is supreme and because the bargain is supreme the contract has to be followed and it's not a question of only a contractual liability the question of there's been an ethical dimension to it also you should be a man of your word the uh, the promise should be worth the paper it is it is on in any case and these clauses She's talking about defenses, sir. What defenses are available? Defenses, defenses. Suppose by the cross section, the same thing. Let's let's say in the opposite. Uh, uh, yes, Suganda. The defenses would be very well. These would be the defenses to be available. You have to say that one, uh, depending upon what is clause you're saying, it offers preventing, hindering, or delaying. First of all, you have to see what is it, how is it, it been invoked, and you can then see whether the legal threshold for each is there. This is number one. Number two, what you have to say is it beyond the control. Number three, you can show that there is no causal link between uh, this. Number four, you can say there was an alternative method, or they could be you did not do anything to mitigate whatever whatever had to happen, whatsoever in so far that is concerned. It's not something you invoke it. Number five, you have to say the procedure, and so is it the procedure which is followed? Now, if the procedure is not followed, why? What is the point of a procedure? Why is the procedure prescribed the first major clause? A procedure is prescribed the first major clause so that you can put the other side to notice as to what is it that you are going to do. And justify your doing it, so that if you put it to the other side and give an explanation, the other side is then put to notice of your defence for you to meet it and contest it. And when you contest it, you can show that see your reliance on the first major clause is misplaced because the circumstances do not track the first major clause. Because the first major clause is basically a term of a contract, and the way in which the term is drafted, keeping in view the principles on which first major is based, you are not entitled to invoke the first major clause at all or not. So much as a person who is invoking a force major clause has got a fair amount of options, legal options available uh, to him for the purpose of invoking a force major clause, in so far the person contesting a force major clause is concerned, that person concerned is also have that particular options. Now, while this is concerned, we have to deal with uh, this. This force major clause is concerned, which is uh, something which is often missed. Is we have certain uh, specific events which are there in the force major clause, and along with the certain specific events that are there in the force major clause, we got a. general all embracing all sweeping residuary clause and say anything else uh, of similar nature or something like that which which normally comes over here now how is that how is that to be interpreted now there are some judges that say you know that we uh, it's where the issue is concerned uh, uh, these clauses have been construed narrowly broadly now don't go by these words narrow broad is not uh, it's not a correct description much like interpretation of statute it's a strict construction is a thing of the past Now let us look at the clause at this, and look at the scheme of the act, and see what is the meaning. Because the question is, what is the meaning? Narrow, broad is irrelevant. If it is, if the meaning comes narrowly, it's a narrow interpretation. If the meaning permits a wider interpretation, wider interpretations, don't have this preconceived notion about narrow or broad. Look at the clause for the purpose of deciding what it is. Now, when you look at this particular clause, you have to see: Did the party have in contemplation the event in question? Now, if the party could not have in contemplation the event in question, no matter how broad that particular clause would be, that will not be part of the first major clause. So, it will not be part of the first major clause. Why? Because the first major clause is a contractual term, contractual terms in which prior to what is happening, the parties agree as to what is going to happen in the event of there being a situation like this to actually come up. Now, that is in that event. What is important is that if suppose it is not in it. Then the question would be: It is a question not of first major, but it will be one of frustration, provided the condition of frustration are satisfied. If not, as a major cause, it is not there. Therefore, it will be frustration because frustration also has got its own discipline. So, when you are dealing with these larger words, which follows the specific word, that the triggering circumstances is over there. What you have also to see, and that will also be important when you talk about defences or to a first major clause, was it in the contemplation 
of uh, was it in the contemplation of the parties at the time this particular event because it has to be in the contemplation of the parties yes there have been certain if you look at chitty chitty in one port portion of his book has referred to some judgments which actually disagree with this particular issue and say and the expression which is used there is essentially that a party cannot be made liable for a party's in improvidence this is what chitty has actually said but uh, even that being considered whatever uh, uh, the improvidence the party's wording is concerned keeping in view the distinction is there between frustration and force major unless you can actually show that yes it was in the contemplation that will actually leave a, a window open and allow access of foothold to a person to actually distort the bargain and distort the bargain by bringing into it circumstances not in the contemplation so as to defeat the agreement as altogether so uh, it's very important to know how the broader aspect because the things are not normally generally missed how the broader aspect of uh, that force major clause has to be seen this is also very important relevant both for person invoking the force major clause as also the person actually seeking to defend what the force major clause actually is uh, as far as this issue is concerned this is also you had something to ask me sir yes sir so uh, there are certain questions coming in about yeah, yeah. Uh, contemplation of the parties because we are on the subject of contemplation of parties yes. now yes. nobody saw covid 19 coming nobody saw corona virus coming oh, no, so that should be related only with the particular force major clause or it should be even more specific as to mention what particular events have to have happened should it be defined if we could make this probably standard force major clause i'm just talking about situation because we are in this year to contemplate point is in law we have to be clear in concepts uh, once you are clear in concepts then wording become very simple and not only wording comes simple our understanding of wording also becomes simple so we have to look at we have to go to the basics of it you have to understand now to deal with the situation is supposing the clause uses the word epidemic or it uses the word pandemic now so that question is concerned epidemic being there you don't need to mention covid epidemic is there pandemic is there i'm talking about situation i'm not talking about the triggering events please understand i made a distinction between the triggering events and the general words uh, if a uh, pandemic is mentioned or, or epidemic is mentioned that is a specific triggering event if a specific triggering event is there then on a on a literal reading of the contract it will be covered by it. subject to the discipline of the uh, clause as to way in which it is being interpreted what i'm talking about are not a specific triggering events i'm talking about a general word is called a triggering event and because it is in the ambiguity of the general word that the honesty or dishonesty of plea will be tested and if this is the clause which has to be actually examined then in so far and the and the invocation is to be in something justified then it has there should be something which the parties had in mind when they actually did it because it can't be a catch all phrase for every kind of problem which a person actually seizes for his benefit ex post facto because that is not something which will be within the ambit of a force page clause or, or uh, whatsoever so it is only this is so that when whoever is watching this and looking into it thinking about it when you look at it you have to see what is the force page that's why i began with the fact it's basically a contractual term it's a contractual clause now what is the when is when is it a contract contract in the parties had either and when they agree but what do they agree upon if they agree upon something then they have to be bound by that agreement so if they were bound not to include something which is there in the general clause then how can you invoke that into the force page clause it is in that sense that i am saying that as per this issue is concerned it had to be seen in that context not in the context of specific triggering event but in the context of a larger broader wider word which follow the specific triggering event which is over there so if you if you have drafted it and that size where i began at the end, at the outro itself these particular clauses are very important as to how you draft them because you have to consider all the six situations which is over there and then provide for it not provide only for triggering event provide also the procedure for invoking the triggering event and also see the consequences of the triggering event because that they still can avoid the contract altogether you may not avoid the contract altogether you may suspend it you may delay it you may limit it you may perform it in 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 a in a restrictive manner it all depends on the way in which it is it, it is worded so these are the issues which therefore have to be considered where uh, this aspect is concerned and while dealing with uh, uh, while dealing with this particular issue that's reason why also we have to see to what extent we have to process the method by which this is to be triggered by, by which it is to be invoked uh how do we how do we see it i mean are we are we going to be insistent that it has to be a condition precedent to the invocation that the method which is stipulated must strictly be followed or it has to be something else uh which has to be there so this has to be something which has to be seen in addition so this particular issue which i am saying about method and contemplation are essentially dealing with the general word which follow the triggering events in any case and the triggering events in any case can be specific 
and in a triggering event, it's a specific. The effect should be either preventing, hindering, or delaying the performance. And preventing, hinder, and delay will be different. Not necessarily avoiding it altogether. Avoiding it may be in any case a last resort. But whatever all this is happening, there has to be a causal link between the event and what has happened. It should be beyond the control. No, it's not a question of a system generous. You see, uh, there are a host of principles which are over there. In any case, so strictly speaking, the question of a system generous will not apply because it's not necessary that everything may be of a particular class or servants where it's concerned. There are other principles also. There are principles also of uh, 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 words which have to be used distributively across the contract. If one is a system generous, there will be nursery exercise. There will be principle of, of adopting what is words used and using it distributively across the contract. Now, that depends upon the word, the way in which the contract uh, contract is worded. And of course, you are absolutely right. All these are tools of interpretation. Manisha is absolutely right, is concerned. These are tools of interpretation, this is concerned. And how we construe it, of course, as a lawyer, as a litigator, you have a, you have a job to do. You have to defend the client. But you have to defend the client uh, in a manner which is legally permissible. And while the result may not necessarily be... Right. Sir, be... Yes, yes. No, it's so a limitation is concerned. A limitation is that we, we don't we go from uh, there are two aspects to it. Limitation under the Limitation Act, uh, because whatever is suspended, or limitation in the sense the way the the clause is worded. And when I use the word limitation, it's not in the statutory sense of Limitation Act. And so it is the cause of action. That is the limitation is concerned. When should there be a cause of action? So yeah, we got a three we got within three years, in six years, in nine years, twelve years, or ending two months, whatever limitation or period. I'm not on that sense. Limitation in the sense of extending the time uh, of performance of the contract or saying okay i had to i had six months to perform a particular job i can extend it by about say nine months or by extending by three months more i give nine months more uh, for this particular purpose that all depends not on the statute that depends on the contract the wording of the contract and whether you are talking about hindering or you're talking about suspending or you're talking about delaying the performance of the contract and whether there's a provision at all for that now if there's no provision for that uh, if the word it's not been worded accordingly, then you cannot invoke the first page clause. So limitation has got nothing to do with that limitation. The way the question is concerned, not relevant. She is asking, can it be inserted now if no, it's not? The first page, if a first page clause insertion, it'll be innovation. And so that will change the contract. That will require uh, agreement of the parties in any case. Now it's not you cannot unilaterally do anything. Contract is always add item. The parties have to be add item, and there has to be agreement and consensus. So that's a contract essentially agreement. Now, the point is, if there is no first major clause, suppose there is no first major clause over here. If there is no first major clause in any case, then in that event, you can you can rely upon the frustration, frustration. Or there may be other clauses in the contract on which you can rely upon because the contract is basically a composite of many different clauses. And you, the parties contemplate many different situations. And the situations, they can also see, they can be a price escalation clause or they can be a period extension clause or they can be some exemption clause which is over there. In any case, so you look at the contract itself. And you look at the contract itself, you look at the various clauses which are there in that particular contract for the purposes of seeing whether there's any other provision in the contract in which you can rely upon. And there's no provision in the contract in which you can rely upon. In this case, of course, you got the law of frustration in any case is available to you. Point is the requirements of Section 56 of the Contract Act are satisfied. Because as is very well known, as far as we are concerned, the principles of English law, and that is very well settled, the principles of English law persist the value only. We are governed by a contract act only, and the terminology of the contract act will prevail. And frustration will be not a question of English doctrine, a question of rule of law, as has been incorporated in the statute and actually interpreted by the courts. So, in so far as the question of insertion is concerned, that is a bilateral, that will be an agreement between the parties. But want of first major clause in some way will not in any way affect because then you can actually have, you can fall back upon. The, the the doctrine of uh, the, the doctrine of frustration or other clauses in the contract for the strip club. Yes, sir. On that very point, if we argue frustration under fifty six, would not we be repudiating the contract as such? So say no, the if no. parties wants to continue performance of the contract, yet there is no force major clause. Then how does section fifty six operate in that circumstance? So force major clause, you see, uh, fifty six will only operate. Away, there is no force major clause, and that is what uh, the law is very clear. This concern, uh, the, and the, uh, uh, the the law is settled, and the uh, systems are all set. This concern because uh, Satya Pratap Ghosh case, this uh, the Supreme Court yeah. actually Satya Pratap Ghosh case, the Supreme Court had dealt with it, and there is one line in which which uh, which uh, in the energy watchdog case, the Supreme Court has actually both of the submissions have been made, and one or two lines the judgments have been sent. I think they have been over broadly stated. The, 
the arguments have been made and also the judgment been rendered. No, uh, it knows this particular distinction is done. Now, Satya Bhattas Ghosh case specifically says this, that when there is a clause in a contract, and it is in a, it will be discharged in terms of the contract itself. When it is clause, it will be discharged in terms of the contract. And then you will not look at 56 at all. You will look at the clause of the contract for the purposes of saying whether it, it is available at all or not. And as the question which Subhendu you put to me, uh, you as far as first major is concerned, the first major will operate, as I keep saying, according to its uh, terms. And because it operates in accordance to its terms, it's not a question of avoiding it. You can, if the, it permits it, to avoid it in circumstances that we avoid it in terms of what the clause actually stipulates, not independent of it. But frustration is different because there's no clause. And in frustration, I have to say a supervening event which makes it either illegal or impossible, makes it it's either legal or physical impossibility, or makes the contract qualitatively different. So as to in some way undermine the very purpose and understanding behind a particular arrangement to make it materially different from what was originally contemplated by the parties. That is that is frustration. But in first force measure is concerned, the parties have actually, before the uh, issue uh, event has arisen, agreed as to what would be the circumstances in which they'll be discharged the obligation because it is allocation of risk. It's essentially allocation of risk, which is there in this particular uh, method of uh, of, uh, of uh, contractual uh, uh, incorporation, wherein the parties decide as to how is it that it has to work. So the two will be actually, uh, the two will be very different where that is concerned that they will, they will work. A force measure clause will act according to its term and tenure. A frustration will act according to whatever the principal uh, principle abides as far as 56 is concerned. So you're talking about essential services. No, if government no, is allowed. No, yes. no you see, let, let's see. Essential services again. You are confusing two, two or three different things over here. Uh, uh, essential services are, are will be in the list which the government has actually done to exempt them from uh, some of the rigor of uh, the prohibitions. Now, if it is exempted from the rigor of prohibitions, then to that extent, the prohibition will not in any way be availed for the purposes of enabling a person to take advantage of the force major clause because it is exempt from it, as far as this question is concerned. Now, inability to fulfill the contract, again, the same thing comes. You have to see, first of all, and as I keep repeating the same thing, there has to be a, a causal link between the inability and, this, uh, and, uh, and the triggering event. The event should be beyond the control, which should, in this particular case may not be because it is beyond, uh, it is exempted from the from the limitations. And most importantly, it doesn't exempt you from the obligation if there is a possibility of the contract being performed in a way different differently. But yet substantially in terms of the contractual arrangement, then in that event, the fact that that alternative method of working the contract is available will not in any way entitle you to invoke the first major clause itself. So all depends upon the factual scenario. It all depends upon the... It depends on the clause, one. It depends upon the factual situation to which the clause applies to. It depends upon how, how you interpret it, three. And the legal consequences will, will be on a case-to-case -case basis as to the circumstances there as presented and as incorporated in the clause. You asking something, Shubhendu? Sorry, I, I stopped you. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. We can continue. So, so, so everything, you see, all depends, and that's what I'm saying, because we have, we have a clause, the clause has a, has a purpose, the purpose has a, uh, is expressed in the content, the content has the procedure, the procedure has its consequences, the, consequ the, the clause, the content, the procedure, the consequences have a method of interpretation. The method of interpretation has to be placed in the context, the context has to take into account the entire purpose of that, that particular agreement. The overarching requirement is there should not be need to dishonesty. If there is a possibility of performance in any case, notwithstanding whatever may be stated over there, that must be available. If it is available, then the question invocation of force major clause will not in any case avail. You have to look at the matrix of that particular situation itself for the purposes of concluding on on on, on a case to case basis whether the force major is actually applicable at all uh, or not. So it's not something which is uh, you can say something an easy heuristic or something as a rule of the thumb which can be applied mechanically with or. Uh, Rather simplistically to what is what is what is happening over there, it has to be decided. It the clause has to be drafted with intelligent care, and it has to be used with a fair amount of understanding of what the legal provisions are. Only in which case you can actually justifiably invoke the first page. Right, sir. Uh, so we've we've covered a little bit of virtual hearings. We've covered uh, force major clauses. Well, I
ได้ไม่เยอะหรือไอ้คนเอาจารย์ไม่ออกใช่ไหมอ่าได้ครับอาจารย์ sorry there was some technical glitch so somebody had post post this question that uh, because of virtual hearings in future would it be possible that lawyers who are not based in Delhi will actually but wish to appear before the honourable supreme court would actually have this opportunity from where they operate out of their hometowns and maybe get a chance through virtual hearings to address the honourable supreme court I'll just Absolutely. try to relay that question as well But in the meantime, absolutely, absolutely. If supposing, I mean, that is the that 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 will be the advantage of the virtual hearing. So the it will in obviate the need of travel and save the costs of it. I was because as this this topic was on a trial court as such, this discipline of the appellate court, the trial court, will be different because the hearing will be different in any case, and the steps will be different. We need to have a different kind of uh, setup for the appellate court. But yes, as well, the Supreme Court has a particular system. This would be one of the advantages of the system that yes, if the system is in place. In that event, there can be a, a virtual hearing by a person sitting remotely at a distant location. The problem, however, here is that unlike appellate court, say in say Canada or for that matter South Africa, which I was just pointing out, as uh, for that even Australia, the number of you, uh, the Supreme Court doesn't sit. Uh, all the judges don't sit together. We sit in benches. Of course, they sit in benches. In any case, the workload is distributed across benches. And the workload distributed across benches to have a system which will in fact cover all benches, so as to accommodate everyone from different parts of the country to take part in all the multiple hearings. Which are taking place simultaneously in the Supreme Court to manage the time in such a way that everyone in different parts of the country can actually take part in all the different hearings, taking different parts of the court, all before different judges, but require a feat of sorts which will be, uh, which will require devising of a system of uh, with a fair amount of care, and of course whoever will be in the charge of system designing will have to take all that into account. But yes, if we can devise a system, this will be one of the advantages the system will definitely have. And so another thing comes about costs. Whether we as a nation can actually bear the costs involved in actually having subordinate courts convert to virtual hearings, can we actually bear those costs? That was also. Oh, actually, uh, I uh, that's uh, when I began. Uh, I began. I pointed out uh, we need to upgrade. Uh, see, uh, uh, we need to upgrade our uh, judicial system, and uh, there is a need, definitely a need, uh, to allocate a larger proportion of our GDP to to courts because. We are understaffed uh, in many ways, and we are overperforming. Uh, despite despite the limitation and constraint system, we are, the system is working fairly well. Uh, uh, the naysayers and the uh, doomsayers not standing. I'm not. Uh, I'm, I don't buy whatever they say. But cost is never an inhibition if the system can be efficacious, and particularly if it is for a good cause. I don't think cost would be something which has which which can which should ever be considered an impediment. But talking about costs, I personally feel that the fair amount of improvement which the system requires, the existing system requires, rather than augmenting the system in a way to in incorporate this uh, uh, incremental change in the system to deal with the existing problems first to address them in a manner which makes uh, intelligent sense would be a, a very important first step uh, for this. Uh, the the prohibitive nature of cost, if the efficacy can follow, but I got some. As I pointed out in the beginning itself, I got some reservation where that is concerned, not because of the technology, but because of the way in which our system is working. Uh, mainly because the costs are prohibitive, but not in any way should should not be a deterrent. In fact, there should be more payment uh, uh, towards this end. This is a very thought-provoking question. <laughs> <laughs> no, you see, uh, uh, AOI will never be uh, eliminated because, uh, as I said, digitization is part of the entire process. And the rules will have to be in place in any case. Yes, digitization can facilitate uh, litigants to file too. But when the procedure is in place requiring a point person, as in the Supreme Court, the purposes of uh, uh, of requiring some some kind of authenticity and legitimacy to the court documentation, then a virtual hearing. It's not a virtual hearing supplants the system. The virtual hearing integrates into the system and then adapts the system to a virtual hearing. So it's not as if the AOR has been some extent rendered completely redundant. But the AIs will be integrated into that particular system. That's uh, something uh, very personal. On, on a, something different from the topics that we are discussing here. In one yeah. of the past 
interviews you had uh, mentioned that obviously you have this uh, fondness for writing your blogs are very popular online you all have we keep reading your blogs all the time so in one of those interviews you mentioned that uh, one the single biggest contrast between you and your father was that uh, you never participated or you kept away you maintained a distance from maybe politics or maybe politics of the bar as such yet you said as as being responsible citizens we must be uh, intelligent observers this is a word you had used and so keeping this in mind on one hand if we could also talk about how uh, activism today and in some way you had also refer that it's actually becoming a fad so how do we draw this fine line of distinction between being an intelligent citizen intelligent observer and also being an activist yet not having it uh, converted into being a fad just for being active or being an activist just because it's a fad so how do we draw that thin line of distinction uh, you see uh, it all depends on the ethics of action i personally feel uh, that's all uh, why is it we are acting uh, do we have an ulterior motive behind it or we have some kind of altruistic intent behind are we doing it for the sake of self aggrandizement are we doing it for the purpose of improvement and what is the ideology which is motivating us where is it that our commitment lies is the commitment to a larger cause larger cause which will have an interest across that is actually an issue now the question is uh, how is the larger cause seen now unfortunately we are politically divided into ideologies this concern but not sharing difference in political ideologies and not sharing whatever uh, difference in the point of view may they have a certain certain core issues are non negotiable that is concerned activism is very important Uh, activism must necessarily uh, be motivated by ethics of propriety which is there keeping certain things as utterly non negotiable now what are the things which are non negotiable this concern uh, in a country as liberal like ours unfortunately the activists who are actually uh, in 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 the domain uh, move in many ways to either slander or divide and slander divide not because they are bringing truth to the fore which can just be open to criticism but because you are in some way manipulating public opinion to a particular point of view as long as activism is not towards manipulation and activism is bona fide for the purpose of advancing a cause so that there can be some kind of meaningful participation and all to make, have a resolution of something which is in public good i personally think activism is to be to be sought after and is a hallmark of an intelligent active citizen but unfortunately today what i find is that in so activists are concerned activists have private agendas of their own and these private agendas never come to the fore and under the cloak of activism which is given some kind of uh, 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 standing of uh, some uh, uh, ultimately grand act or some service uh, what is actually being done is uh, you are in some way projecting and promoting ideas which can in some way affect uh, the country general good as such i have got nothing against activism i have got nothing against activists but we have to look at whatever activism is done in individual cases dispassionately objectively and the activist should also be answerable to themselves as to whether why they are acting so if you answer the eventually uh, the call to conscience is the only check on any kind of behavior and as long as if we are honest with ourselves and in our private moment can actually we answerable to our conscience to in some way justify what we have done i personally think that we will find an answer ourselves activism is good but misuse of activism is bad Right, so thank you so much for that answer. And another question to all for all our young aspirants to the bar as well as aspiring budding judicial officers, I would just like to know on behalf of everyone that what is how do you prepare for cases? Is there any to do list as to which goes in preparation, which you've been following for the last thirty years that you've been in practice? So for all our young friends here, what would you like to say to that preparation? Well, I- You can praise for the kind of preparation you put in and how you prepare for cases. Well, so it's not uh, my my kind of preparation. Uh, and I've been told when I was I was a junior lawyer and I was working my way up. My friends just tell me help without work, and I'll frighten the clients away and I'll frighten lawyers away. And uh, there are lawyers also today who are in some extent different in coming because I am rather exacting uh, in the way in which I work. I would not recommend this style of working at all to anyone because God so many pitfalls to it and it's the work. uh it's not easy but that said because you asked me this uh, i like to see the weakest point in my case first uh, this is something which i and i look at my weakness in the case uh, first before i go to my strength and i like to anticipate and uh, outthink my opponent 
because uh, if you steal the other person's thunder and adopt the opposite side's arguments and in some way are preparing advance for a question which can unsettle most, then you can approach the court with a fair amount of aggression and confidence which can actually hold you in tough times. And what is very important is you need to have the respect of the court who should actually believe that what we are saying has got substance because if the court has respect for you and you are reputed to make arguments not flippantly but seriously and what you say is, is, is taken with a fair amount of healthy respect, then no matter how difficult the bench may be and no matter how tough the matter may be, your uh, hearing in court will be smooth because you will be convinced of your point and will be more or less confident of ability to convey it. But that requires a fair amount of labor and uh, you cannot ever stop working or studying. And you have to be constantly aware of whatever is involved in it. And as I said in the course of this particular thing, approach it not case-wise as conceptually. You should have an idea in your head as a concept as what the matter is. And then navigate your way through it. Because there's an understanding, there's a clarity in understanding of the matter. Uh, unless there's a clarity in understanding of the matter, you cannot, handle it. you cannot handle it. So don't go only to case law. Pick up law books, pick up reference books, pick up theoretical books, pick up look at the uh, uh, core issue in it and then develop an argument and develop an argument looking at the weaknesses first. I would not recommend this. As I, I mean, I, uh, I, I've had a tough time in my practice because a fair amount of fair element of fear uh, in so far as briefing is concerned, which will be shared by many people. But I, uh, I'm otherwise comfortable with the way in which I work and enjoy working there. It's another question from our, one of our young friends. He says, yeah. what will be the impact of virtual hearings for young lawyers? Will, will it lower the level of arguments in courts? No, not at all. Uh, uh, there's a lot of grandstanding in court, uh, which is uh, which is part of the drama of court. It makes courts a very exciting place to be in. Advocacy is performance in public. It's 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 like uh, it's like a dance, a ritual, which is there, which is it's got its own charm. I became a lawyer for that purpose. I personally think I find this whole thing very exciting. You're pitting your bits against other and trying to come on top. That said, as a virtual hearing is concerned, it's uh, it you. Uh, that option which is there with you to have to play to galleries is to some extent obviated because you're only in your office looking at the screen and you have to be very business like and serious about whatever that is concerned. Yet, yes, uh, it is an option to use the senior lawyers in any case because uh, the the uh, fraud which is normally practiced in court about face value, and I call it a fraud generally because this is in most cases uh, circulated by the lawyers themselves to get work will to a large extent be affected because you have judges, you've got lawyers for judges, you've got lawyers for benches over there in any case, uh, which can, of course, which, which which will be as real even in virtual hearings. But yes, with remote accessibility and uh, greater access, the non so-called non-entities in the lawyers, and I personally think the young lawyers these days are far better for fever at our time. They are uh, hardworking, sincere, and very well read. They, these lawyers would also have, will have greater access to court and uh, will be at less of a disadvantage because there will be a captive hearing between a judge and the court and the court, judge would have no option but to hear and as the lawyer, the young lawyer that he is, is ready and prepared, he'll have a good day in court. That's, I think it's it's been a wonderful session, sir, for all of us. Uh, before we conclude, we would have uh, Shri Ashok Kashyap, who is the president of our unit, the Adhimutta Parishad Delhi High Court unit, who would like to deliver the vote of thanks, sir. हेलो अमन जी कैसे हैं मुझे बताइए शोक नमस्कार नमस्कार आप कैसे हैं बस एकदम ठीक रिलेटेड टू सी यू हाउ यू आई एम ग्रेट आई एम ग्रेटफुल दैट यू हैव कम एंड एक्सेप्टेड आवर इनविटेशन दैट रिमाइंड्स मी बड़े लेकी साहब जी यू नो हिज मेमोरीज आर स्टिल लिंगरिंग विद मी जी जी सो वी हैव वर्क टुगेदर जी जी ए ग्रेट सन ऑफ अ ग्रेट एंड नोबल लॉयर Mr. Aman Lekhi. Yeah, definitely, he was both great and noble. You don't yes. make lawyers like him anymore. But he was a very versatile lawyer as well as noble as well. Yeah, that's because right. Because I know him. He Gee. used to he used to always trust the truth, nothing else. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Uh, you know, we are doing this study circle. This is our first study circle on Gee. online. I will call, call it as a virtual study circle today. Yes, yes, that's true. And, and hope to do more study circle like this. You've done a very good job, sir. It's, a, it's wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. I must commend you for this initiative. And I think there'll be many more such uh, such study circles and with the, with the sweep uh, and the reach, it'll be definitely much better than whatever you've done up till now. 
this is the teamwork of mr subendu who has yes, conceived, this, <laughs> conceived this program i said okay yes. go ahead i am with you whatever you do i will accept it so he no, said aman ji is coming mai ka very well mai ka aman ji i know him very since childhood and yes, it will be okay. pleasure to hear him pleasure to hear him you have explained everything everything on the, both of the subjects in a very well manner and i think lot of viewers and our lawyers will be well benefited by this thank you for i thank you on my behalf as well as on behalf of my team and adhivakta parishad so so that we will invite you again and again and again uh, this is a first vir virtual study circle i also thank you to the viewers i must thanks the subendu archit vikrant ji and akash those who have taken pain to have this study circle thank you very much namaskar thank you thank, thank you. you so much uh, thank you so much ashok sir uh with right. this i think we have already uh, concluded given a very uh, <laughs> a good conclusion so we were joined by a lot of uh, viewers over the course of uh, the last one hour we had initially okay. thought this was our first experiment and first attempt we were actually unsure about how it will uh, uh, come out i think it's it's been fairly well received by a lot of people all over the country and no, no, it has come very well it has it has come very well and uh, i think we we must do it on, on all india level definitely sir and and, uh, and, uh, and the lawyers like aman should be called again and again and they should devote time to the cause of the lawyers as well as the cause of the subjects thank you right uh, to enhance the knowledge of all the fraternity so i also thank you to the viewers also those who are watching this beautiful program by aman lekhi thank right, you so with that sir we'll uh, bring this wonderful session and informative and i think a session full of knowledge and thoughts yes. for us be it lawyers be it uh, judges be it teachers be it professionals uh, and sir on behalf of the adivakta parishad high court unit i would like to extend uh our thanks our gratitude for having taken time out of your busy schedule because we had approached you last week with this but uh, in a second you consent you gave your consent and you agreed to come on this broadcast so sir this has been i think probably we've had the best possible uh, speaker as 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 a first certainly certainly the panel and i think sir this will only uh, continue because these days everything is uh, on the world wide web because the world wide web is in sharp contrast to how we are actually witnessing roads outside our homes where there are yes, yes, yes. Are. but the world wide web is extremely busy yes, these yes. days and anyway there are a lot of webinars that are going on but sir thank you again and uh, oh, no, don't worry about lagunas don't worry about lagunas you commit mistake and learn so many things right <laughs> so thank you so much sir we were streaming live on facebook and youtube channels for uh, for everyone's uh, information this video will be available on our respective youtube channels as well as the facebook page so if anyone who has missed out will be able to view it and this video will be there for time mem memorial and we could all hear keep coming back and keep hearing sir again and again and again and on behalf of everyone sir we take our leave thank you so much for having graced us this evening sir thank you so much thank you thank you very much thank you all of you thank you all of you